So, uh, yeah, I'm Bhaskar from Mostack, and uh, I've been working on web technologies for a year and a half now, the mobile web especially. And uh, apart from that, uh, I mean, recently I've been doing, yeah, uh, so I mostly do the front end part of it, although, I mean, being a startup, we do all parts simultaneously. So, uh, and I did my BTEC from College of Engineering Rookie. And uh, another thing to add, I haven't yet recovered from a very bad cold, so please uh, excuse me. Okay, so I guess we can begin. So first, I want to show you something that we built, and we recently presented it at TechCrunch Disrupt 2011 in San Francisco. Let me show you a live demo of it. Yeah, that is our rendering of the TechCrunch website. I mean, uh, so this is a totally, <coughs> sorry, this is a totally different experience. This is not a website per se. I mean, as in it doesn't have a horizontal scroll and you keep on going and all kinds of things. And it is a very, uh, what do you call a magazine-like experience that in the way that you go, go on flipping and you continue to read the content. I'll try to load if it, the 3G works. Aha, here we go. So, this is the article. Uh, let's get to it in a while. Sure. Try for minutes. Okay, so, so here's what we see a very <clears throat> It's back on edge. Damn it. Come on. Why does it have to suck? Please load. Okay. So finally it loads. Yeah. So here we go. So we have a complete touch friendly experience built specifically. I think it should work. Damn it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I know. It miscalculated the resolution or something. I guess. Yeah, I'll just show it from the iPad itself. The connector is pretty buggy. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is our rendering of the uh, of the TechCrunch website. Although it's not working the way it is supposed to because it is on edge right now. So okay. So when we are creating the touch site. We uh, thought about, like, uh, we started from the scratch and we uh, figured, uh, tried to figure out how do we want to build it. So the most, in, the initial approach, or rather, the classical approach to the, to building the websites that you can call Web 1.0 was that you, you have a step, I mean, okay, uh, from here on, any example I'm going to take will always, uh, should be taken in the context of a dynamic page that is rendered on the server with some data. That's dynamically changing every time. So, uh, in the in the initial scenario when there was no AJAX and the web 1.0, what used to happen was every request was a fresh request which the client made to the server. The server would take the template, take the data, render the template with the data, and send back a full page which the server then uh, sorry the client then uses to load. Then uh, you have to load the next page. You do the same thing again where a template, a, a template and data is taken, rendered on the server, sent back to the client. And this is repeated well, infinitely. So uh, now the problem with this approach was, for one thing, it is, I mean, uh, it doesn't provide a very beautiful experience in the terms that the page reload and the whole flicker, uh, it, does, it doesn't really give a beautiful experience. So uh, what we started, oh, by the way, 
that the question you asked, it is a website. It's running on uh, off our server. So it's not a, no a native app. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> the next approach that is uh, taken, I mean, currently I think more, more than 80% of the sites are running on this approach, uh, is the Ajax web where the first time you, uh, the client makes, makes a request, the server sends back a full page, then the components on the page, which are the scripts and the CSS and, and the other uh, elements, they make requests for more data to the server, and the server sends back the uh, data as needed. But in this case, uh, the data that is sent out the later times is, shouldn't be the complete page. It can be just a piece uh, of, uh, it can just be a markup for uh, that, that, that can fill a particular element in the page or replace or add or whatever. I mean, that depends on the use case. So uh, the, the beauty about Ajax is uh, it gives a much better user experience because the page doesn't reload and all. For another thing, it is much faster because much lesser data has to be transferred. It's much lesser overhead on the server because the server doesn't have to render the complete page. It, it can just send back the relevant data. So uh, the, that is a couple of reasons that Ajax took off. Now, what, uh, what and this is the, the generic uh, way of uh, doing Ajax, which is rendering on the server. What happens is server takes the template and the data, it renders it on the server, creates the markup, and sends it back. The markup can be a complete page or a part of it. What we try to do, we, did, we, did, uh, we try to render on the client, which means the server sends back an empty template, it's a, and it sends back the data in the raw form, and the client handles the task of rendering it and displaying it. Okay, so uh, now there are a couple of benefits to it. For one thing, on a device like the iPad, uh, there, are there are many parameters which the device knows instantly, which the server, for which you'll have to make additional requests to the server. For instance, the orientation. So uh, the exam, I mean, the way we built our system uh, and the requirements that we had didn't allow, us, uh, allow uh, didn't allow us to have a complete flow layout because it is separated into pages, so to say, or screens, if you will. Uh, so we had to do the task of breaking the data down. Now, if we had been doing, uh, if we had been doing that on the server, the server would need to either send out both responses, one for the portrait and the other for the landscape orientation in the beginning, because, or uh, when the when you reorient the device, the uh, device would have to make another request to the server to, to do that. Which again, I think both of them are well suboptimal because the data is being transferred twice. So. What happens when you're rendering on the client, the device knows the current orientation, and uh, like I showed you on the iPad, it was running on the full screen mode, and then you can run it within the Safari. <coughs> I'm sorry. So uh, in that, if you run it within the Safari browser, the dimensions of uh, the area available to the application to run changes, and uh, which, which actually matters in our, uh, in our use case, which is uh, a fixed layout. And uh, the, the data has to be re reflown ac uh, according to, I mean, your current orientation or uh, the mode that your browser is in. So all that was taken care of by the client. So the server can always send back a template and the data, regardless of what state the device is in currently. The client, uh, which is the iPad or any other mobile device for that matter, knows the uh, knowing the current orientation and all. And uh, given that these devices have pretty decently fast uh, JavaScript engines right now, they can they can process it much faster. Before you know it, the, the site is there. I mean, even when you reorient it, you don't as much notice the re, uh, the whole re-rendering because there's no basically no time lag. So what happens on the client rendered web? Initially, the client does the same, which is make a request to the server when there is no uh, no data yet whatsoever on the client yet. The server sends back a loader, so to say, which is a basic page, which is sent the classical way which, uh, by rendering the template in the data as, as required. And when that data, uh, that, that page loads, it sent, the script fires and they send requests to the server to get the new data, which might be, I mean, 
that depends on the, the use case. Like in our case, a gesture, a swipe can tell the browser to load the next page. And when, when the swipe asks the browser to load, load the new page, uh, the browser makes a request to the server, which instead of sending the whole rendered HTML markup, it just sends back the data. Here's another benefit to it. <laughs> Sorry. The template for a particular kind of page, say an article, is the same across the articles. So it can be cached on the client. So the first time you request a template, it is brought and cached on the client, and then on the only uh, the data is sent out from the server, which is JSON, which is, I think, the most compact and beautiful uh, way of presenting data. And being that uh, it is a native JavaScript object, it's much, uh, I mean, it's much less overhead on the client to render it as well. So client renders it, adds to the DOM, and well, the JavaScript takes care of uh, showing the transition and all. So that is how we chose to do that aside. Okay, uh, there might be a question in a couple of you, uh, your head. Uh, why not jQuery mobile? Uh, when we started, we thought about jQuery mobile. So uh, there were a couple of ish I mean, given that I'm not saying that you cannot use jQuery mobile, but our use case did not as much permit us to do that because, for one thing, we had a very fixed layout, uh, which was given us given to us by the designers, and uh, that layout had columns and all. Now, uh, there, there were a couple of constraints. In the way the CSS3 columns are implemented right now, you cannot, uh, you cannot span multiple columns for any element. Say, uh, you, you can't span an image or a title like, like it is done on the top side, on the top, and then you start with the content and continue to reflow. So we realized that we had to do the task of breaking up the data into pages ourselves, even if you want to use CSS3 columns or anything. So we just decided that, as I mean, if we are go going to do it, we might as well do the whole rendering ourselves. Another thing about jQuery Mobile is that it follows the classical approach in the fact that, uh, in the way that it requests the whole page each time from the server. Then it it has a very fixed layout where you have fixed IDs and uh, identifiers for the various uh, elements on the page. You break, uh, then it gets the page, it breaks it down, and then it loads the appropriate relevant data into the relevant boxes and show that with the transition. Now, that was kind of counterintuitive, given the fact that we had a control on the server and we could, I mean, while we could uh, choose to send much lesser data, why, why should we choose to send the complete page each time? That was another thing. Then, yeah, it is. Once we, uh, yeah, so when we started splitting up the data, I mean, jQuery mobile doesn't do, do it for you. So splitting across the pages and all, that caused us uh, jQuery mobile uh, to slow down. I mean, it was running its own. It, it does a bunch of things uh, amongst itself, which is uh, it does the request in the backgrounds and all kinds of things. And uh, in addition to that, when we tried using the, uh, the uh, so there's this library called region.js that we used to split up the content. When, when we used to run that, in addition to jQuery mobile, it, it would really slow it down. I mean, it was a really bad experience. So we chose to not go with jQuery mobile. And we started taking a look at uh, the other possible options that we had. So uh, for rendering on the client, we found a couple of other uh, Java, uh, jQuery and JavaScript based libraries. But we ended up using Mustache because of a couple of reasons. Sorry. So your question is that uh, how I mean I have to repeat it. Uh, how mobile Safari does it on complex templates? I mean how efficient is it? Okay, for one thing, uh, like right now we just have the iPad, and given the fact that uh, there are lots of Android devices coming in, the tablets and all. So 
once you expand this, I mean, the, with our approach, the problem was that we had a fixed layout and the design had a couple of uh, requirements to it, which required data to be split up and all across the device, uh, I mean, across the pages and all, or screens, as, as we called it. So, uh, doing all that on the server is kind of not possible. I mean, it, it is for one thing because the client knows where the data is beginning and how much it is occupying and all that. And even if we pre determine it, pre compute it, and save it in the server, the next time there's something changes on the on the client, uh, say the orientation or something. I mean, they, they they have to be like hundreds of combinations of the. I mean, this is our use case that I'm talking about, where you have to split the data yourself. And uh, doing it on the server is just painful, to say the least. Okay, so uh, after going through the couple of options, we land, uh, landed on Mustache because, for one thing, uh, on some running some tests and benchmarks, the Mustache had pretty good, uh, if not the best, it had pretty decent uh, performance. The very, <coughs> I'm sorry, very big advantage that it is available in like 20 languages. So you can you can use the mustache template on the client or on the server. I mean, you can use the same templates across the system. You, you can choose to render them in whatever language you choose, on the client or on the server, as you may please, as the use case may be. This makes it very flexible. And also, you don't have to man maintain 20 copies of the templates for different languages to be rendered by different uh, templating engines. And of course, it does the the. <coughs> The mustache uh, templating language is very, very similar to the Django templates which we use in our uh, system. So it was an easy transition for us as well. So, uh, okay, so what are the actual benefits that we gain? I mean, what do we gain after do by doing client side rendering? First thing, our servers don't have to worry about what device it is, what state is it in, or uh, I don't know, what orientation it is in, or any of, any of the other 20 configurable options. It just always sends back the data, which is the JSON compressed in really small amount of data that is sent every time. And everything else has been preloaded on the client that happens initially. And then on, is, I mean, it's blazed fast because of the high powered, uh, I mean, the, the JS engines allow us to do that today. Then uh, that allows the server to not worry about different kinds of devices or even different. I mean, you could power a native app and a mobile uh, and a web app using the same backend framework because the what has to be done by by the data uh, 
I mean, what has to be done to the data has been de determined in the client. So the native app or the web app can determine uh, how to display it or whatever to do with it. And another benefit with that is the, uh, we can cache the response, which obviously enhances the uh, performance. Uh, the, I mean, all the data that is, because there's no rendering per, per uh, issue or per condition, the different, like even the template can be cached in, at one place and the data in the other place. And uh, both are sent separately to the client and then the client handles it. So th uh, that gives us additional uh, speed. It, it saves a lot on the server cycles. Uh, the server doesn't have to do the rendering each time for each page or each part of the page for that matter. And of course we save bandwidth because JSON is like pretty small amount of data compared to any other format. And uh, it save, we save it on the markup as well. And uh, also the caching is done on, I mean, the template is cached the first time it is loaded. So next time on, uh, it doesn't make a, another additional request to the, uh, for the templates as well. Okay, so this is how Mustache looks like a template. These uh, double curly braces, uh, these, these define a variable. I mean, uh, you can substitute these with a variable value. And the, uh, for for loop and if loop, there is the same uh, representation, which is hash within the double quotes. And uh, hash is the opening uh, block and slash is the closing block. So uh, if it is, if you have to iterate over a couple of, like, I'll just show you the data uh, using which I've created this example. Uh, so if you have to iterate over a couple of values and uh, you have the same, I mean, suppose it's a list or an array which has the same data structure, you could just do a hash uh, on that parent, I mean, the array name and uh, the children can iterate. And the other thing, uh, if, if there is no, I mean, it also suffers the if, the same hash and slash. So as you see on the bottom, the blank, which will, uh, which is, if it is not in the data, it won't just be, uh, there. So uh, for our current example, supposedly we have this data. So you can take a look back at the template. So here is action. And then we go uh, repeating on a couple of array elements, which essentially are all JSON objects again. So what happens when you render it using the stash? This is what you get at the output. So much lesser data to be transferred, and much more of output uh, that can be generated. And uh, essentially, they are logicless in the sense that there's not much you can do about it. They are not as powerful as Django templates. But still, uh, if you, I mean, if you manage your data properly, and if you want to give uh, power to the browser, you can use uh, the mustache templates. Not yet. We are uh, actually we are looking into the Python implementation of Mustache to try it down on a, on a server. Uh, other apps as well. So I'll show you a quick demo. Maybe this looks a little better. So uh, this is a <coughs> live version of I mean, uh, demo of mustache.js. On the top, uh, the first text area has a template that I've created uh, just some text with a couple of cases where you have an if and a for, and then you have the data. 
in uh, so when i say render template it generates the html out of this template and the provided data <coughs> i'm sorry and here at the bottom is how it is actually looking i mean uh, so on the top you see the html and at the bottom it is the actual rendered html in the browser it's a very basic demo and it's pretty simple to use you can just uh, if you get both uh, template and data you can just load the mustache library and call mustache dot to html and that's pretty much it uh, by the same uh, this hash and slash right. which is i mean at the bottom one it doesn't show up because it, i mean it, it it acts both as if and for depending on the data type which you are iterating it on uh, an additional thing that you can do i mean it's logic based it, it, there's not much power to it but yeah one more thing you can do which is uh, if you use instead of two you use three quotes it allows you to uh, put in uh, what do you call an escape html as well so that that prints the original version of it so we can use additional yeah we can do basic additions yeah sorry yeah underscore okay to underscore uh well for one thing i haven't used underscore myself so sorry about that and but i think uh, the motivation for us to use mustache was primarily the easy implementation similarity to django and multiple languages support which i guess we'll we are definitely trying on different uh, other platforms as well so so if we use that yeah you can provide uh, that data structure pertaining to the language and that implementation i mean that depends on the implementation uh, on that language I mean, this is just an example from our own code, where uh, uh, we, I mean, how do we send back the templates initially? So, uh, I mean, in, in for the touch side, we, I mean, this is the very basic version where we only have a, an article layout and a contents layout, which is the grid that you saw. So, we don't have many templates, and those are very basic as well. So, we initially we just send them on the first request. which makes it pretty fast i mean uh, we don't have to keep requesting for them over and over again and we send them back at once so we just take the uh, we take the templates we dump them into json and we just uh, send it to the client where it caches it and starts using it uh, then on so when you say caches it doesn't create a fragment of the template you can uh, no on the client you can just i mean uh, javascript can just store a javascript variable for that matter No, it doesn't.
and this is our uh, data view which basically just takes the article object dumps it into json now uh, for this we use our custom encoder that we have written all it does is uh, it calls a function on the model uh, a method which uh, takes the required attributes that we uh, that we need in our um, uh, in in javascript and we dump them into a json object and send them back that's pretty much so uh, what we plan to do with this uh, what we have right now is uh, for one thing we uh, want to make it more much more interactive where different i mean you can customize the design and layout of the the touch site so the reader can make it i mean to uh, to design it to his wish as much as as possible for another thing we are also try, uh, thinking of trying out uh, for the high end uh, phones like iphone and the android phones which can support the similar functionality we we are trying to uh, roll out a similar version of the site where rendering is done on the client so i mean that's that saves the server a couple of uh, i mean milliseconds i guess a microsecond for that matter uh, and it it will use this uh, similar layout and uh, then eventually we we, we might use uh, i mean move to a layout where the same template is rendered for uh, a device which cannot support javascript on the server i mean uh, so Uh, a device which cannot support the javascript the page is rendered on the server and sent back and the devices which have high end support for the javascript like I iphone they they uh, receive the template and render it themselves so that's the python mustache implementation and uh, so thank you questions yeah does it do any kind of html verification no it doesn't it's a it's a you can i mean instead of html you can just put in normal text as well it's a it's a it's a template it, it doesn't really care about that it, it only cares about its own uh, blocks which is the quotes yeah okay so use uh, to mu use mustache with django will uh, i mean be, i haven't implemented that yet but i'm assuming that obviously we'll have to change the settings in django to use the mustache templating engine we have to use pystash on the server and then uh, use the similar same templates to do the rendering on the server yeah the same templates would work
Yeah, we are, we are doing it initially just because uh, we, we, we don't have that many templates and they are pretty simple as well. I mean, if you have a big uh, fr framework of site or something where you want to uh, support like 20 layouts, you can send them one, one by one uh, the way you choose. Yeah, so, um, so the idea is, right, so we did a lot of things to make this a lot more like a native app. So if you don't see the browser, you actually won't realize that you're running inside a browser. I mean, if you don't see the bar, basically. But this is actually exactly running in Safari. And, and so what we do is, like, if we take, oh, sorry, don't have an internet connection. 3G is pretty bad. But, you know, so that's, it's not working because of the, So, uh, yeah. Sorry about the hiccups in the, in the demo. That's mostly because of our bad. But, sorry? Framework to render what? Sorry? Huh. No, that's all our code. Yeah, yeah. The only thing we're using is we're using Mustache to do the JavaScript rendering, and we're using jQuery, which everyone does. Other than that, everything else is being done by. Yeah, we're not. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just uh, this is just one template that we have done for. Uh, this is our default template, so to speak. When we first launched, we. Uh, sorry, bad luck. Yeah, this is only the default one that we've launched. So what we're doing now is essentially our the iPad template, the mobile template, will all be in sync. So it won't matter, the URL will remain the same. So for example, if you are, just example sake, you are uh, plugged in, right? You all be plugged in, right? Plugged in's URL is the same, plugged.in. But you would, if you are, so the way it works right now, plugged in uses mob stack. If you hit plugged.in from your mobile phone, you won't see the PC version. You'll see uh, m.plugged.in, which is rendered for a mobile, uh, you know, for all kinds of But now when plugin goes live with this, if you hit plugged in from your iPad, you'll see this. And they're all in sync in terms of the grid field and all that. And we're going to roll out a couple more uh, you know, different kind of templates, one for magazines and one that is more easy or newspaperish, all of that. So we'll have a couple of different options. This is completely configurable. This is all just, I mean, ultimately the look and feel are the same. It's still done in HTML, file, and CSS3. Yeah. That is still the same. But what happens in the JavaScript, that's all. And the way we code this up, right? So the third party developers down the road, not yet. We don't yet have critical mass to open it up to developers. But what we would like is this whole theme is actually three files. So theme.js, so portrait.cs, landscape.css. Done. That's what the theme developer should have to write. And the rest of it is is the glue that Mobstack gives you, and then theme developers can just use the APIs to get their work done. So this is just an, I mean, this is, the, we are amongst the, I mean, probably the, I mean, there's only, uh, there's only one other company that, in the world today that can do this on, you know, for publishers. And the way you do this is you just, I mean, people can sign up for a product. We're in private beta right now. But they can come, sign up for this, and then once it's opened up to them, their existing site automatically gets this. Because we have a, uh, we have an integration JavaScript snippet. If you put that into your existing website, then anybody who hits your site from a mobile site, device, either iPad or phone, they'll automatically see the mob stack rendered version. So that's how we integrate. So plugged in has that plugin installed on his site, and the Hindu has that plugin installed, et cetera. 